Good evening. I'm back again because I forgot to say something on the last one, right, about Tony Connolly. Right? Now, Tony Connolly, right, in 2017, right, called me up, right, and he said, Paul, he said, I am retiring now after 40 years on the knocker, being a drug dealer, money launderer, right, sexual offender, right, and he said, please, he said, will you stop targeting me? Right, he said, I know what you're up to, because what had happened, right, was that um, I'd got intelligence that Tony Connolly, right, had sent down an armed robber, right, to Goodwood House, right, to rob Lord and Lady March, okay, and he'd done the reconnaissance when he'd gone down to the um, Goodwood meeting, the car meets they have down there, because he went down in his McLaren, right, the F1 icon, McLaren, with his boy, because his boy's into motorsport, I ain't going to mention that to the family, right, but anyway, Tony Connolly goes down there, and he does the reconnaissance, and notices, um, right, where it, where the robber could get in, window, so boom, all of a sudden, he comes away from there, right, and this, and an armed robber goes down to Goodwood House, ladder up to the window, ladder, ladder up to the window, he goes in, right, and all of a sudden, he gets disturbed by Lady March, so he, so he attacks her violently, and, Lord March violently and ties them both up, right? And he make, he forces them to tell him where the jewellery is and he gets away with a um, £400,000 diamond tiara, some other jewellery, a ring with a great big emerald in it that belonged to Charles II, right? Um, they, they estimated it at 700000 but I think it's probably, I reckon they're just saying that in the press, I reckon it's two, three million pounds worth. Right, they might just be saying it in, right, so anyway, two, three million quid's worth. He, right, the, right, the um, armed robber gets out, gets away, boom, off he goes. The next morning, the staff come in and find Lord and Lady March tied up, right? So I get the intelligence that Connolly's handling this shit, right? It, sorry, Connolly's handling, handling the Goodwood Diamonds, right? Now, I'm not going to say, you know, Dave Bishop was involved or Lee Town or, or whoever, you know what I mean? I ain't going to say, I mean, you know, I've got no evidence of who the armed robber was, right? But Connolly was the one who recruited him, right? And Connolly had, um, was handling it, right? So anyway, I'm talking to Rachel Millard, who was the crime correspondent for the evening Argus at the time, right? And I'm talking to her and all this, Karen, and I'm saying, she said, well, what's going on then, Paul? I said, well, there's a bit of intelligence. Um, I said, Tony Connolly um, is, is handling the Goodwood stuff, and he organised it, she went, really? So then Rachel Millard goes out home to old Sean Road, right, to speak to Tony Connolly and confront him. I thought, fuck me, she's got a lot of balls. You know what I mean? Go, you go, girl, right? So she's gone out now. He's, he's come out the door and he, right, she says, you know, introduce herself, Rachel Millard from the Argus. She said about the Goodwood House robbery, right? And he went, what, what? Hey, hey, um, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, it, it was, um, pikeys, gypsies. Yeah, they did it. I know nothing about it. Nothing about it. Right, and she went, oh, okay, then thank you very much, and then she left. She then comes back, right, and anyway, she phones me and says, Paul, she said, I went over to see Tony Connolly. I went, what the fuck? I said, what did what'd you do that for? She said, well, I thought I'd just confront him with it, that he handled the diamonds from Goodwood House. Right, so I went, well, oh, okay, fuck it. I said, well, you know that he's going to know it's me. And she's like, oh, sorry. I said, don't worry, Rachel, it's all right, don't worry. So then we get back to the 2000, right, so now Connolly knows, right, that the reporter from the Argus has gone to see him, he knows that it's me, I'm, you know, he's taking the message back in turbo, Paul Hendry knows I'm involved in the Goodwood thing. So then 2007, 17, 2017, when Tony Connolly phones me up, right, and says, Paul, he says, I'm retiring um, after 40 years from 1977 when he got released from Borstal to 2017 on the knocker and drug dealer and money launderer and sex offender, right? He says, I'm retiring. Can you please stop targeting me? And as a sweetener to you, he said, I will give you Joey Sanson. He said, who's back in Brighton, back in the UK and back in Brighton and he's dealing at a high level, right, in drugs, Right, I went, oh yeah. I said, well, let me tell you, Tony, I have not been a registered informant with any police force since 2003. Right, and I'm not really interested in that. So then all of a sudden, he's, oh, all right, and, boy, anyway, and then all of a sudden, we go, we take a trip down memory lane. 
He starts telling me about Melvin and how he sold his building for two million and he's bought a, um, a boat for 75,000. And then after a year, they finish drug smuggling and or a couple of years and he takes it to Olympia and sells it for 125,000. Says he's the only man in his street to buy a boat, all right, and sell it for nearly double what he paid for it. I said, well, perhaps the secret compartments might, um, helped it sell and he laughed and all that game. Right, and then we and then we reminisced about other things and all that carry on, right? And then, right, he said, "I know it was you, right?" Um, he said, "I know it was you um, that that um, sent Rachel Millard out to speak to me." I went, "Oh yeah, why is that then? How do you know that?" He said, "Well, when she came out and spoke to me, right, and she asked me about the um, Goodwood robbery." Um, I said, I knew nothing about it. And she said, well, that's a lovely car, the McLaren. And he said, oh, I'll take you for a drive. Right? He said, so I took her for a drive. He said, and we started seeing each other. Right? And then she told me that you was her source. I went, oh, all right. I said, well, does it matter? I went, yeah, of course I was her source. I said, because you did handle the Goodwood diamonds and all that carry on. Right? So I said, anyway, what are you going to do for your retirement? He went, oh, me and Melvin are going to go around America. Um, he said, no, I've got all my properties. Um, he said, you know, one or two other bits. He said, but I'm not on the knocker anymore. I've retired. I went, oh, all right. And okay. Right. And we spoke about other stuff and all that. And I, and I can't remember it at the, at the moment, but I just wanted to get this bit out. Right. So then all of a sudden, boom, the phone goes down. This is like 2017. Right. Well, then all of a sudden I then, um, start my Instagram page and putting all this stuff up. And then I put up a tweet about, um, Tony Connolly and how Rachel Millard allegedly um, uh, gave me up as her source. So then Rachel Millard last week reaches out to me last Wednesday, right, and, and phones me up. Hello, Paul, where are you going? Yeah, all right. Yeah, she's working for the Telegraph now. She's doing well. You know what I mean? You know, she's like the finance or the energy correspondent doing wonderful. Right, and she said, I, re I read what I said, yeah. I said, well, I, I told her the truth. I went, well, Rachel, that's what he said. I said, he said that you said you liked his McLaren and he'll take you out for a drive, okay? And then you, um, and then he said he started seeing you and you gave me up as a source. And she said, what fucking planet's he on? On another planet. She said, Paul, I would rather die in a ditch than ever give up a source. I said, well, I know, I believe you. I said, I said, obviously, Tony Connolly was trying to um, use that as leverage to try to get me to admit that I was your source, right? But what he didn't realise is I admitted it straight away anyway. I went, yeah, of course it was me. Of course it was me who'd done it. I said, Johnny, I had to pick the phone up, right? So anyway, Rachel was sweet. She went, okay, thanks very much, Paul. I went, she said, I was more concerned about you than anything else. I went, no, don't be stupid. I know you're 100%. Straight as a gun barrel you are, Rachel, anyway. I said, don't worry about it. Look after yourself. She went, all right, okay, keep in touch, boom. And that was last Wednesday. So I've then done a little bit more. Um, I've put a few bits more up about Tony Connolly, right? You know what I mean? My archive, right? Where if you think of war and peace, right, it's like two of them, right, standing on top of each other, the information I've got about Tony Connolly, right? So now, all of a sudden, he thinks he's uh, right, right, He's going to threaten me. Well, I want everyone to watch this and see how far he wants to go um, with this because there is something called disclosure, right? And so at the end of the day, he can issue a lawsuit in the High Court if he wants to do that, but he's going to have to start disclosing stuff about himself, right? And then we're going to get the police disclosing their records, okay? And plus his criminal record, okay? Right, and another one. Oh, and I've got a message for you, Tony. Right, do you remember you said, like, going to Florida and all that, carry on? Well, I had a word with my friend, Bob Whitman, right, who used to be in charge, or he formed the FBI art crime team, and I gave him your details, right, and he told me he put you on a watch list, right, and there was no way you were getting into the UK, uh, US, whether you had a visa or not. Now, I don't know what's happened. You might have gone to America, right, and got kicked out of America or not let through, but sometimes the immigration are not that good, right? But if you've ever been to America, right, and they've thrown you out or you couldn't get in or you've had problems with your visa, I want you to know right here and now it's me, okay? I told Bob Whitman, Robert Whitman, ex-FBI um, art crime team chief, right, that you were an undesirable, which history proves that to be correct, 
right? And that, that considering your visa would be um, very, very wise for the US immigration authorities. Because I guarantee you that when you applied for your visa, you didn't declare your previous criminal convictions, thinking that because they were spent in the UK, you didn't have to declare them. Well, I've got news for you. Under the US law, you have to declare every crime you've been convicted of, don't matter if it was 30 years ago, and you have to get a printout from Scotland Yard, okay, right, and the Young Office, right, on official paper, right, um, dis uh, stating every single crime that they have got on the, on the computer, right, of you or of me. And you know why I know all about this? Because I went through it... <clears throat> I went through it myself when I applied for an O-1 visa to go and work in, in, in America, right? Um, and, right, I um, had lawyers, immigration lawyers in America working for me. I went up to the um, embassy in London and I produced all the um, printouts, official documents of all my convictions. I had an interview and I told them the whole truth about me and everything, right? And they gave me the visa, Right, it was a legitimate visa. So you've got to understand about the Americans, right? Okay, it's not so much what you've done in the past or what whatever you've done. What they hate more than anything is being lied to. Okay, so you can say you've done this crime, that crime, that crime, but it's been 10 years, 20 years, and I've kept my nose clean, or da 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 da, or I'm coming to America to invest money or work or like me, working with you know, with, with movie companies in Hollywood and in, in LA and all that sort of stuff. And they take it into consideration, and I had like, and I had dozens of character witnesses from really high-powered people. They gave me my visa because it was legit. But you, I guarantee you now, right, that when you applied for your visa, you went for one of them waivers where you say you got no convictions, right? I guarantee you did that. Now you've broke the law, okay? And don't matter if it's years ago that you did it; it'll be on the system somewhere, okay? Now, even though your two convictions, you had one in 1980, well, you had a conviction in 1970, um, 1976, right, for theft of chips from a casino. You had another conviction in 1988, right, for attempted um, um, bur uh, distraction burglary with Danny Newman in Weymouth. You had another conviction, right, in, um, in London in 1989, okay, for theft and burglary. Right, and you got two and a half years, right, and, and done it all in, in Wormwood Scrubs, okay, and you might not have had any convictions since 1991 when you were released, but the Americans don't give a fuck about that. They want to see them, and they want to see them on official paper, okay, so you definitely have broken US immigration law, right, so all I would say is if you've got any plans to go to America, I think you better cancel them, okay. Now, coming up to the latest thing, right, listen, the laws of libel means, right, that you are saying something that's not true, right? They don't apply if you're telling the truth, and I'm telling the truth, okay? This is not made up, okay? You said it with your own mouth, right? Those events, every event I have said there, right, other people, and you think they're all going to keep their mouth shut for you, Tony Connolly, do you, after the way you've treated them, just because you gave um, 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 Doug, uh, Douglas Banjo Bannum's um, wife, a thousand pound when he died. You think that buys you out of it, dear? You? you think there's not a lot of people who know what you did over all the years, right? And probably some of them have got a bit of jealousy because you're worth 10 million pound or a bit more money. You think they're not going to stick you in? You don't think that they're going to jump on board and, and give evidence against you? So all I say, and I say it again to you, Tony Connolly, bring it on. Right? And if you've got any thoughts of anything of, of an unfortunate nature, let me just explain right, the circumstances over here, right, I live in a village, right, okay, there's one road in and there's one road out, now my road, you know where it is, yeah, right, you go up the top of my road and it's the beach, right, okay, now in my road, right, I've got serving and um, and retired police officers live, three doors down is um, um, retired detective chief superintendent Dave Staplin of the Metropolitan Police, over the road there's two serving officers, I'm not going to name them, Right, okay, right, another thing, there's cameras all around the village, right, and that's not for me, it's nothing to do with me, right, right, but the, I'll tell you the story, okay, the house over the road from me is a double-fronted bungalow, right, and it was owned by Paul Parker, Joe Parker, and in 1980, he got convicted of, 
of importation, right, of um, of hundred and what was it, thirty tons of of of, of marijuana in the seventies, right, and um, five hundred kilos of cocaine back then. Yeah, right. But he turned Queen's evidence, right, in nineteen eighty, famous trial. The others got twenty five years, seventeen years. Joe Parker gets six years. Well, part of the arrangement he had with the government then was that he gave them the house across the road from me, right, an 120 grand, a couple of Range Rovers, but anyway. So now the government owned the house across the road from me in 1980. And what they did is they installed two civil servants there and they used it because it's out the way down here, right? Um, it's a little village by, uh, on the seafront, right, just uh, the other side. Pevensey Bay, I mean, I ain't fucking hiding. Pevensey Bay, right? So now they used the double-fronted bungalow Right, to debrief MI6 agents that were coming back from Ireland from 1980, right, and they sold the place in 2000. Okay, now in 1991 or 19, yeah, 1991 92, do you remember Selman Rushdie, you know, the author? Right, I can't even remember the book he wrote, right? That's how boring it was, right? Um, he got a fatwa against him from the Iranian government and all the, um, um, the Mullahs and all that carry on, right, to kill him. Anyone who kills him, they get they get money or all this kind of stuff, prestige or something, right? So he was taken into protective custody by the British government and given a close protection team, you know, like royalty or um, um, like the Prime Minister, right? And they installed him over the road from me for a year. And the reason was, was that his old mum, Salman Rushdie, was staying um, in the Belmont nursing home, right, just down near Asda, it's been demolished now and there's new houses built there, but it used to be a nursing home called the Belmont Nursing Home and Salman Rushdie's mum, old mum was there for a year before she died and Salman Rushdie lived over the road with me with his close protection team. I got to know them, but they were very good because I can tell you in a whole year I did not see Salman Rushdie once. He was in the house, right, I didn't, didn't see it. And another thing, feature of the house, upstairs, the rooms in the roof where the close protection team was sleeping, they had cut out in the wall for their machine guns, right? Like from, the, you know, but it was cut out in like foam. You know, you get like them foam cases where, where it's all foam when you put all your camera equipment in and all that. But they had the same sort of thing there where they put their machine guns, fucking machine guns, right? And obviously kept their, um, their I suppose they used Glocks or something, right? So they were there for a year, right? Now it's been sold, right? It's been sold and it's um, serving police officer, Right, retired police officers and, and, and they foster kids who've got problems from London, right? Around the village, right, other places, right, there are other security agencies and other agencies that use, right, some of these houses down here, right, because it's a transient place and the population's transient and it's very quiet. I always call Pevensey Bay the Stoke Poges of the South Coast, right? Now, any historians out there, you know what I mean, um, who know about spying and all that game, Right, remember that Stoke Poges in Buckinghamshire was where they used to debrief Russian defectors in the 60s and 70s in the Cold War, right? Well, Pevensey Bay was probably the same uh, then. It, they use these little out-of-the-way places. So if you're thinking of something untoward that's going to come that's going to come on top over here, right? Oh, and another thing as well, let me tell you this. Sussex Armed Police Response Unit, right, is based at Lewis and Gatwick, Right, they can get here in 11 minutes in the BMW X5s they used to use, souped up. Now, I've just heard, they've bought a Tesla S Plaid, right, which means they get here quicker. Right, so boom, from the, uh, right, from, from getting a call to get here is 11 minutes. Do you really think you're going to have that, or the people you might think of employing are going to have that amount of time to do this? Right, but they might have time to do this or, or to do, whatever they want to try to do to me, right? But you can be rest assured you ain't going to get away with it. Do you know what I mean? Right? And at the end of the day, it's going to come on top. And you're so worried about your businesses, right? I think that's the last thing you need to worry. Now, if you look in history, people like you, who are organised criminals, Tony Connolly, have been in this position before. And then you've got to think about, what do I do here? If I go after Turbo, Paul Hendry, right, and, and put a contract out on him, Right? Is that going to backfire on me? Okay? You've got to think about that. And is that going to cause more shit and more shit and more shit? Okay? Right? Well, it's entirely up to you. You can do exactly what you want. Okay? Right? I'm not bothered about it. 
But just think about it. And the thing that's going to kill you more than anything, Tony Connolly, that's going to hurt you more, is that you know everything I've said is the truth. And now the rest of the world knows it is the truth. Okay? I think you should go back to your family and I think you should sit them down, right to the lawyer daughter and that, and you should say, well, look, I've done some bad things in my life. Okay, but that's because I've now provided for you all this multi-million pound stuff and all that. But I had to do some really bad things. And what Paul Hendry's saying on the um, um, art hostage turbo Paul is saying is actually true. Because you, you, you sit down with your, with your lawyer daughter, right? And you quietly, you know, uh, lawyer confidentiality, even as a daughter father, right? She'll ask you the question, Dad or Mr. Connolly, is any of this true? And if no one's looking and you know that you're going, uh, not being recorded, you'll look at her and you'll go, yeah, of course it is, all of it. And then she'll go, well, what the fuck are you doing? At the end of the day, it's all going to come out. It's going to make it look a hell of a lot worse, right, than what it is now. But listen, please, bring it on. Do you think I'll give a fuck? I ain't got fuck all. You can get as many um, um, high court defaults against me as possible, right? It don't matter to me, right? Because all you're going to be doing is shining the spotlight on this and actually... Um, I'm, I would prefer this all to come out, right? Because I haven't defamed anyone. The only thing that I've done against you that might be wrong is spell your name wrong. Instead of C-O-N-N-E-L-L-Y, I spelt it C-O-N-N-O-L-L-Y, okay? Right? Now, I've got other stuff to, that, that, that I'll do, but I just want you to have these little two things to think about. 24 hours from Tulsa. Really? Okay? Oh, and another thing, just before I go. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you this one then, right? And you'll like this one, right? Apparently, a few years ago, someone called Tommy Semensky or Semensky or something like that, right? I don't know how to say his name, right? Apparently, he owed you money. And you saw him in Bloomsteins when he was scrapping some gold, and you gave him a right coaching, right? Went right into him, laid right into him, right? And then you went off, and you thought that was the end of it, didn't you? Yeah, but Tommy Siminski, do you know what he was going to do? He was conspiring, right, to kidnap your children. Oh, yeah. And I heard about that because he told someone else and I told someone else. And all of a sudden, I heard about that. And that was nipped in the bud before anything happened on that. And so you'll be sitting there thinking, fuck me, how's you know about that? Will you remember the incident, right? Tommy Siminski or Siminski, whatever he calls himself, he owed you money. You're in Bloomsteins. Right, scrap in some gold and you see him and you lay right into him. Right, verbally, I think it was, not physically, I'm not sure. Right, verbally. Right, and then he left there and thought, right, I'm going to get Connolly back. Right, I'll fucking kidnap these kids. Yeah. So that was something that fucking was prevented that you don't know about. So just think about all these things, Tony Connolly. Right, and I'll just say it again bring it on. Bring it on. I've got nothing to hide. Right? Listen, you don't have to have a good memory if you're telling the truth. Okay? All right. I'll okay, I'll get back to you soon. Right? And everyone else is listening. Sorry, this was just a little bit of a um, um, personal message between me and Tony Connolly, or Tony Connolly and I. Okay? I'll speak to you soon. Right? The coming week. Art Hostage. Um, and more episodes are coming. I'll speak to you soon then. Good night.